the way I'd like to get started is with a few introductions. So I'm going to introduce all of our candidates and then uh, allow Jane to go first and with her opening comments in the two minutes. So I'm going to start with Jane's bio. Jane Sturk has led the Green Party of BC since October 2007 and is running in this provincial election in the riding of Victoria Beacon Hill. Jane has come the furthest today uh, to be with us. Jane ran as a federal candidate in 2004 and as a provincial candidate in 2005 and 2009. As a councillor in the township of Esquimalt from 2005 to 2008, Jane worked actively on sustainability initiatives. Jane is a successful entrepreneur. She co-owned a retail store in the computer industry that created 60 full-time jobs during her 10 years there as president. She has a PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Alberta and worked as a mental health consultant with the Edmonton Board of Health, specializing in family therapy and organizational development. Jane is a mother of two and a grandmother of two, I believe. She is a past director of the Rotary Club of Victoria Harborside and a tireless advocate for the green movement in Canada. Jane, I'm going to allow you to go forth with your two minutes and then we'll move to Harry. Well, I want to thank um, the organizers of this event. It's very important to uh, think about transportation and how we live our lives. Uh, because for, from the Green Party perspective, that's, uh, that's part of the question. Transportation is part of uh, the way that we form our communities. It's part of the way we make our choices <laughs> about um, who we associate with, how we live, uh, and what we do. And I think that we would all agree um, that our transportation systems are not serving us well at this point in time, whether it's in the lower mainland or in other parts of British Columbia. We see things like congestion, we see things like um, gridlock, we, f we find people spending inordinate amounts of time in their cars, we find people in single occupancy vehicles um, adding to that, that congestion. And so our transportation systems are not uh, helping us form the kinds of communities that we, we need to have right now and certainly into the future um, as, as we were reminded that this is really a question of well, how are we going to shape our, our communities going forward for the next hundred years. And um, when, when we're looking at transportation as a much bigger land use issue, as a much bigger community issue, uh, then we have to look at things like how do we get from work to home, from home to school, uh, and how do, how do we make sure that those communities serve us. One of the things I feel most proud of of my time in uh, Esquimalt is that uh, I pushed our community to adopt a pedestrian charter because we wanted to make ours a pedestrian friendly um, community. And that's uh, one of the aspects that we have to look at when we're, uh, when we're creating the kinds of communities that we need for the future. And um, so uh, our, our philosophy is about living our lives well in community and we do that through a community based economy and uh, rethinking our economic structure. Thank you, Jane. It's wonderful. <laughs> wonderful also in that you kept straight to that two minutes, so I appreciate that. Harry Baines was elected as the MLA for Surrey Newton in 2005 and re-elected in 2009. <laughs> Harry serves as the opposition critic for transportation. Harry's been active in the Surrey community for many years. His experience in education, having served on the Kwantlen Board of, Board of Governors between 93 and 99, and he's volunteered with many organizations, including groups like Habitat for Humanity. <coughs> Harry was an elected officer of the Steelworkers IWA Canada Local 2171 for over 15 years. He served most recently as the vice president of his local where he led negotiations and engaged in bargaining for better working conditions for working people. Harry and his rife, re, wife, Rajivit, Ra, Ravinder, I should know that, live in Surrey. They have two children, Culpreet and Jasmine. Harry. Thank you. And the presence here tonight just shows how concerned uh, people of Lower Mainland are about our transportation issue. And I just want to thank you for coming here and, uh, and showing your support and, and advice on how do we move forward. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have 1.2 million additional residences moving in Lower Mainland in next 
30 years. Rather than planning and be ready to move those people and the goods to service those people, we are moving backward. To meet the today's demands, we, the TransLink suggested that we need 415,000 new hours right now. But because of lack of funding, due to the lack of leadership from Victoria, what we have gone is we've gone backward. 306,000 of those hours had to be cut back. So we're moving backward. We, we don't even have the, the services to meet the needs today. The, the whole, per, whole thing started because of Victoria's lack of leadership on this issue. Rather than working with local mayors, they've been fighting with them, finger pointing, blaming with them. And, and as a result, we, are, we have a system where we have a dysfunctional relationship between Victoria and the local mayors. We have a decision-making process as TransLink that is flawed, undemocratic, and lack accountability, and there's no transparency. Bad decisions in Victoria, such as making carbon tax as a revenue neutral, and, 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 and insisting that certain project must be P3, is costing TransLink more, and it is making us, uh, making us to, to, to pay more and going, continue to go, go, uh, go to our citizens for more money every time we need additional services. So I think we need to fix the leadership in Victoria. We need to come and work with the local mayors so that we can put the system together that will serve the people of the Lower Mainland. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> Minister Pollock. Mary Pollock is currently running for her third term as the BC Liberal candidate for the riding of Langley. She is the current BC Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure and has previously served as Minister of Children and Family Development, Minister of Aboriginal Relations and Reconciliation, and Minister of Healthy Living and Sport. Mary is an experienced BC leader who has also served as Surrey School Board Trustee and Chair. Mary lives in the growing neighborhood of Willoughby and Langley, so she understands firsthand the issues that are important to the community. Mary. Thank you very much, and thank you all of you for your interest in what is a truly important topic, especially for our province, and in particular for Metro Vancouver. When I became transportation minister, it was after having portfolios that were really largely in the social category. Nobody really gave you very much advice. They didn't stop you on the street and tell you their ideas. When I became Transportation and Infrastructure Minister, that all changed. I not only had people telling me all of their ideas, because everybody uses transportation in one way or another, they all have ideas about it, I also found out that there's a significant number of retired engineers living in British Columbia, <laughs> and they all had my email address. I say that because um, transportation, I did not think, was nearly as complicated as some of the files I had previously held. And I was uh, a little frightened, but also pleased to find out that it was truly one of the more complex files of any ministry in government. Every community has a different issue. Every region has a different priority. Everything from burgeoning growth in the Lower Mainland and transit needs for expansion, as Harry's laid out, to whether or not we're applying enough dust suppression um, in the North Peace. That's equally important to them as our crowded buses on the Burrard Corridor. So you have the issues that reflect the very heart of every community. And as Jane says, they also serve to form our communities. Langley's a very good example, a community that has been reliant on cars to get downtown for decades. Finally now this morning, I'm on the express bus going across the port. Man, you've got a packed bus with about eight people standing up. Um, that was unheard of decades ago. There's still more to be done, but growth is that double-edged sword. It's better than decline, but it poses the challenges and puts all these systems under, under stress, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to dialogue with you about all of those stresses and possible solutions tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Dwayne Nickel is running for the Conservative Party in Vancouver Point Grey. Dwayne was... BC, Conser BC Conservative excuse me, Party. BC Conservative Party, excuse me. The BC Conservative Party in Vancouver Point Grey. Dwayne was a co-founder of Yellow Dragon Software Inc., which he sold to Adobe Systems in 2003. 
He continued working for Adobe until 2011 when he launched a new venture, Technorical Advanced Systems, Inc. Duane is an author, an entrepreneur, and a seasoned lecturer on technology and computer systems. He's a father of three and comes from a long line of politically active family members. He has represented Canada at the United Nations working on technology issues, and he has recently been with the United States Department of Energy on Renewable Energy projects as a technical advisor. Duane is also a former World Cup mountain bike racer and cycling advocate. Duane. Thank you. Um, so before I introduce myself, I just want to acknowledge each and every one of you for taking a couple hours out of your uh, busy schedules to come down here and listen to us. And I also want to stay around afterwards and listen to some of your ideas. Um, my name is Dwayne Nickel. I'm a family man. And uh, Mary, I live in Point Grey and I have some great ideas for the transit corridor there. So <laughs> I'm going to talk to you after about that. Um, I've been in computer software for most of my life. I work with informatic systems. So I work with data and facts. Uh, a lot of my life I've spent just working strictly in a sort of uh, generic domain in that industry. And lately I've started working with the uh, U.S. Department of Energy on several renewable energy projects. I'm a big fan of a lot of the renewable and clean energy projects and technologies that exist. And I think we have a huge opportunity here in British Columbia to develop it. We're talking about an industry where we could develop jobs. And when I talk about jobs, I talk about sustainable jobs, which to me mean jobs that originate in B.C., and stay in British Columbia. Um, I'm going to disagree slightly with the, the sentiment that transit isn't working too. The first year of the Canada line, it carried 38 million people. At the DOE, one of the things I learned was one of the places you can be most effective in cutting back on GHG gas releases and improving the quality of people's lives is in large-scale infrastructure projects like high-speed electric rail. I think Vancouver has uh, done fairly well in recent years with that, but it's just a start. I think we have to go a lot further with this. Uh, when I was a little boy, I, I'll confess I wanted to be a train driver, so maybe I'm a bit biased towards that. Um, I used to commute on a, on a bicycle uh, from uh, Coquitlam to Aletown every day, and I realized that isn't a solution for everybody. Um, we have to find a solution in this dialogue we're having tonight, and I'm very excited to listen to your ideas about what can work for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And I have to say, that is how it's done. All of you stayed within your two minutes. That was very impressive. So now we're going to, because we want this to be a dialogue with you and with our candidates, we are immediately opening it up. Uh, to your questions. So I'd like those of you that have questions um, to raise your hands and I will also go to our Twitter feed as well um, if there are any questions coming forward. So I have question one here, question two here, and question three over there. Question one. Yeah. I'm going to ask those of you when I've, when I've directed, come out to the, to the if you can. It just makes it easier, um, <laughs> maybe. or maybe it doesn't, but I think yeah. it makes it easier. <laughs> it well, we don't, like want to, we don't want to hand over the mic. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Hi, I just wanted to um, touch on governance very shortly, and uh, I'm sure you've all read the report that was done on the uh, recommendations from the consultants on governance for TransLink. Uh, one of the things that I thought, I'll, I'll come up with an idea and I'll throw it at you and see what you think about it, is that um, having directly elected people on the Metro TransLink board from the various regions around the Lower Mainland. So what would it, what would it be would be like uh, Surrey White Rock would send two people, uh, Vancouver UBC would send two people, um, B, uh, Burnaby New West would send one, the Northeast sector would send one, Langley Ridge Meadows would send one. So it would be representative of the population. You would have nine people on the board and they would make the decisions directly voted by the constituencies, by, by, by each of them. So they would be on the ballots of those individual um, municipalities. So I'll throw that out at you. Like it's okay, too so short, a minute is too question. short to explain it all, but. So that's a question related to governance from Grant, I believe, from Surrey. So uh, if you have a chance, uh, introduce yourself as well when you, when, when you get the mic. So I'm going to start with Dwayne. And Dwayne, I think the qu question's related to the recommendations on governance and if there's a model here that Grant has suggested that 
Yeah, well, Grant, um, the BC Conservative Party is fully uh, adapting to the whole idea of open government, transparent and accountable. Um, certainly anything is going to be an improvement over what's going on now. And our position is that uh, we believe that the plan would have a lot of, uh, make a lot of sense because the ability to be accountable to the taxpayer for that and the, the transit rider is very important. The regional approach, I think, would actually work very well. Um, the, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I'm, it sounds like a good idea. Okay. It's one of many good ideas. Context-wise, I literally spent a half-day meeting with Ken Cameron, Marlene Grinnell, who is on the uh, former TransLink board and the current chair of TransLink and a number of staff as we try to wrestle with what findings we might bring forward for legislation. That is one of the thoughts, albeit maintaining a professional board for day-to-day -day operations, <clears throat> but having uh, an elected board regionally. Uh, I'm still of two minds, and the reason being that you have to ensure that you're not going to have one part of the region with more weight than another in making the decisions, so we'd have to balance that. And I'm not sure if the public's ready for one more election, but I think you're on the right track. The challenge is how to incent those people to think and behave regionally rather than parochially. Thank you, and, and I agree. The report that just uh, came out was commissioned by the uh, Mayor's Council, and the report uh, said that the, the five or six, the key criteria to have a good governance, and accountability and transparency being the key of, of those six, uh, none of that exists in, 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 in current governance model that we have today, so we have to change that. And I agree that we need to put those people who are accountable to their constituents, who are elected from different regions, to come back on the TransLink board, make decisions at, for transportation, and because those are the people who make a, a decision on, on land use, those two things go hand in hand. Thank you. Jane. Uh, uh, theoretically, the Green Party agrees. Uh, we do think that there needs to be more elected representatives on the boards of these major organizations that are making decisions on our behalf. When we look at nine people representing uh, communities or communities of this size, um, it, it, it's hard to, un to imagine how those people will uh, be a representative voice of all of the potential users of the system and representative of all the, the needs related to transportation planning. And so um, theoretically, yes, we agree with elected boards. Uh, we also believe that there needs to be local government, real local government representation. And then we have to find ways to engage the community in, in really uh, participating in the decisions that are made in the interests of the community as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, question number two, I believe. Jackie, yes, you've got it. Question number two. Hi, my name is Patrick. I am uh, from uh, Richmond. And uh, my question is related to the transit funding and more especially to uh, the road pricing. And uh, let's imagine basically here, uh, TransLink, the Council of Mayor, this, uh, decide to go to the road pricing road. So my question is, Will you entertain it, so basically pass the legislation to enable it, or do you gonna pass the buck to a referendum or something else? So basically I would like a straightforward answer, yes or no. So Patrick, I just wanna be clear on your question. Your question is regarding road pricing yeah. and whether or not they're gonna pass legislation in relationship to road pricing. Yeah, okay. whether I think the mayor asked for it, yeah. Okay, this time I'm gonna start with Jane. Uh, the Green Party believes in using transportation demand management <coughs> strategies like congestion pricing, road pricing, uh, parking pricing. We also uh, support pay-as-you-drive insurance uh, as ways to uh, use mechanisms that we, we have, financial mechanisms, to change our behavior, uh, moving us toward less car usage. That has to be uh, done in parallel to uh, in improving our uh, transit system so that uh, we make sure that we can get people efficiently from uh, home to work, uh, work to a school, uh, so those are, are big issues that need to be done in parallel. Harry. Thank you. And I think, you know, what you're suggesting is to uh, come up with the, with the long-term sustainable funding formula so that we could have uh, funding to pay for the needs that we have today and moving forward next 20, 30 years. Uh, what, uh, what we have said is that there is some money already in the system by way of carbon tax. 
Some of the carbon tax money is being used to give corporations tax breaks. We have already said that we will, we will roll back those, car, uh, those, those uh, tax breaks uh, by another percent, and that should free up over $200 million. And some of that money, because it comes from the province, some of that money will go to the transplant table uh, with a new board, and uh, we will find out exactly how much is needed today and how much do we need to move forward uh, looking at the population growth that we talked about. Great. Thank you. Mary. Thank you. So currently, the process we're engaged in with the Mayor's Council has us agreeing to work firstly on governance, secondly would be on short-term funding, and thirdly would be on long-term. Uh, clearly the road pricing idea would fit more likely into the long-term strategy. There are a range of different types of road pricing. There's everything from straight road tolling like you see in the Portman Bridge to distance tolling. Um, which gets at some of the types of features um, that you see uh, advocated by those who are looking to control demand as well as fund transit systems. Uh, whichever we end up choosing, it would be a result of the work we do with the Mayor's Council, and we've committed that that would then be brought into uh, legislation. But the short-term funding would go to a referendum in 2014 in the fall, and then we would begin our work on what the long-term sustainable funding mechanisms would be. It would depend on what type of road pricing you were talking about. Uh, probably not straight road, straight tolls, but uh, perhaps distance tolling or others. Our party has actually been opposed to the road tolls unless there's a reasonable alternative. Uh, John Cummins, our party leader, has suggested previously that, you know, instead of building another, yet another lane of highway out to the valley, that we should have maybe used that to put in high-speed electric rail. Um, this is something that we don't think is fair if you don't have an alternative. If you're in Langley and you have to commute to go to work every day, uh, that's an unfair tax burden. Um, I wish I could wave a magic wand and, and fix it and they would have some other way to travel, but I can't. I'm not a magician. I'm a realist. Um, as far as the, the carbon tax, uh, you know, some of it going to corporations doesn't tell the full story. In the 2012 budget, if you look on page 61 to 66, I think out of the $1.1 billion collected, $800 million of that is going back as tax breaks to corporations. That's something to ponder. Great. Thank you. Question number three. Thank you. My question is similar to the gentleman. Uh, my name is Thomas. My name is Thomas Bayer. I live out at UBC. Um, it took me almost an hour to get here, taking the bus and walking to the bus and walking here. By car, it takes me 20 minutes. Um, what measures do you propose to reduce car usage specifically in Vancouver or Metro Vancouver? Because car use is far too convenient today and far too inexpensive. So you go over Lionsgate Bridge, it's free. Second Narrows, it's free. Drive to UBC, it's all free. You go to London, it costs you 10 pounds to enter, which is about $16. Um, gasoline is quite cheap in Vancouver compared to Europe, for example. Um, do you propose to increase those uh, gas taxes, for example, or car use, make it more inconvenient, uh, while you, in parallel, try to find funding for electric systems such as a UBC line? Great. Thank you, Thomas. Mary, I'm going to start with you. Sure. Well, so what we're talking about, though, is human behavior, right? Um, and I had a, well, I'll use my Langley experience, right? Um, so there have been buses to get you to SkyTrain from Langley. There have been buses to get you to SkyTrain from Langley for quite a number of years. Uh, weren't getting a tremendous amount of use. Why? Uh, not because they weren't inexpensive, but because they were very, very inconvenient. Um, so for the general public, I don't think you can go simply at one place and say, well, we'll raise gas taxes, then people won't drive. Or we'll raise the price, price of cars, they won't drive. You have to combine price incentives with convenience. With the express bus now, the reason people are using it is because it comes frequently enough, and it's not as much of a hassle as taking an hour to get through Surrey on a bus. So we have to remember that human behavior isn't just about what costs us. It's also about what we experience. And if we're able to sit in our car and listen to music and get there in a comfortable time uh, to make transit possible, we have to make that as convenient for people. Harry. Thank you. And I think human behavior changes if you give them affordable, efficient alternative to cars. And we haven't done that. On one hand, when the carbon tax were brought in, it was meant to discourage people to drive cars less, but we failed to give them alternative mode of transportation. So they continue to drive car, 
and there's no alternative mode. So that's the reason. And also, I think this notion that everyone traveled to downtown Vancouver is wrong. South of the Fraser, 82% of the trips that are taken south of the Fraser remain south of the Fraser. So we need to deal with regionally and overall picture, take, take, keeping that in mind. How do we connect with each other? How do we connect those, those town centers that we have in different parts of the lower mainland with the buses and with SkyTrain or LRT technology? That's the overall picture that we have to take a look so that people are driving less, leaving their cars behind, but they have an efficient and affordable and user-friendly system that they could go to. Okay. Um, since you mentioned London, I'm going to point that out as a primary example. Um, I haven't taken a taxi from Heathrow into downtown London for probably about six or seven years because the Heathrow Express gets you there in 20 minutes and a taxi takes you 45 minutes. To me, it lies with the enticement of people to a more affordable and a more enjoyable experience. Um, you know, if you had built down the middle of Highway 1 a high-speed electric rail, instead of another lane of cars, which just moves the congestion a little bit further to Vancouver before it backs up. The very first time somebody in a car was stuck in the traffic and they looked by and all these people were sitting back, sipping cappuccinos, reading their books as they were going, you know, yeah, I'd be like, tomorrow I want to do that. And I think that's the kind of planning we have. Now, we've got a challenge. Unlike, um, you know, we, we can't lay out our city in a hub and spoke like Vienna, which is one of the best cities for transit in all of Europe. We, we can't just rip stuff up. So it's, it, it remains a challenge. Jane. I congratulate you for taking the bus and spending that extra time when it would have been easier in terms of your time management uh, to take your car. Uh, and I think that it takes that kind of commitment when you do understand <coughs> the consequences of our, our choices. Uh, but it is frustrating when uh, that happens. There is another alternative that we're seeing here tonight. Uh, that may address some of the things that we need to think about as in terms of how we live our lives. Uh, there is a live stream of this event so that people are able to watch this event from their homes. They're able to send in questions on Twitter and participate in that way. And sometimes I think we need to uh, make our choices about how we live our lives to be more in our communities rather than uh, assuming that we always have to uh, travel somewhere in order to participate. So the next question I'd like to take is on Twitter. So, Chris. Sure, the first question comes to us uh, by email. Uh, a resident of Saturna Island asks, uh, ferries are the transportation arteries and the public transit of coastal British Columbia, much like roads in the interior or TransLink in the lower mainland. The province pays for 100% of the cost of the roads and 100% of the costs for the 14 inland ferries. Why are coastal taxpayers and visitors to the coast treated differently from those who live and travel elsewhere in the province? Harry, I'm going to start with you first. Thank you. And it is a serious concern. And the people on the, all along the coast and on the island, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a lost city is, has gone to a position where, where the rates of the, uh, the ferries have gone up and the ridership have come down. And coastal uh, communities are suffering economically and, and they feel that they are stuck there and, and that they're not getting the help that they need. What we have suggested that we will, we will freeze the uh, uh, ferry rates for next two years. In the meantime, uh, do a study so that we know exactly what the needs are and how do we fix this ferry system so that uh, you know, taxpayers on uh, both sides of, uh, of the water get the, um, the benefits that they, that they deserve and they need. Great, thank you. Jane, I'm gonna go to you. I think that the question uh, recognizes that there is some inherent unfairness in how we have structured our ways of transportation. Um, I think, I think the, the figure is about $2,000 a year per car that we subsidize uh, for our highway system. And uh, we do need to find ways of pricing that into uh, our car usage so that um, partly to discourage people from using their cars as much. And we do need to uh, look at how we're going to use the ferry system uh, mm. to get people uh, where they need to go. Uh, and, and it is a very big, complex problem. And I think that all of these questions that we're getting tonight uh, address a huge issue that we all need to face, is that everybody's demands cost a huge amount of money. And uh, we have to, at some point in time, identify our priorities, make sure that our revenues are directed toward those priorities and making sure that we have sufficient revenues to get done what we wish to get done. Thank you. 
Yeah, there's two core tenets in the BC Conservative poly, uh, policy platform, and one of them is fair taxation. And what you just described uh, on email uh, with the ferries is uh, a form of unfair taxation for those that is forced to, to take the, uh, the ferry. Uh, the second thing is enshrined in the policy document is the fact that the ferries are actually an extension of the road system, the transportation network, and they're uh, essential services, really, and that's where government should be spending money is in essential services. Um, John Cummins, our leader, had come out with a uh, press announcement talking about some rebates for those who had to pay for ferries and tolls as part of their daily life. It got truncated a bit and a lot of people, I think, misunderstood why, you know, why we were adding an extra of government of tax and then giving back money. And the realization there is that, you know, for occasional users who are using it for tourism or tourists coming here, there's a fair share of payment of our resources and our transportation infrastructure. But for people who use it for their core work, that's something that I think we should be uh, looking at very carefully. Thank you. Thank you. We just finished a, a very comprehensive consultation all across British Columbia about BC ferries, so I'm going to cut to the chase because uh, in spite of uh, some of the illustrations, I think the real argument that's coming through is we should have BC ferries as part of the highway system again and that would solve everything. The reality is the challenges facing BC ferries are those facing ferry systems around the world declining ridership, rising fares, rising fuel costs. Whether or not BC Ferries was made part of the highway system, i.e. you weren't paying fares, you would still have to deal with the challenges of extremely low utilization in some places. The Ferry Commissioner outlined that ferry users, provincial taxpayer, and BC Ferries all have to be part of the solution. And it might be interesting for people to note that while fares are going up, they actually now form uh, only 62% of the costs of BC Ferries, whereas a few years ago uh, it was 64%, and it's been dropping. So currently, the taxpayer in British Columbia pays about $180 million a year to take up the, uh, the rest of that cost. So I'm going to open it up to another round of three questions. We've got a question over here, a question at the back, and then at the very back there. So there's a man with the glasses midway. Yes. One. Two and three. The woman standing. Yes, there's a woman. Increases pretty much every year. Hi. So my name is Tiffany, and um, my question is about the hundred million dollars that was spent on the turnstile system in, in TransLink and the, the new Compass program. I'd like to hear whether you think this was a good use of uh, taxpayer money, and if not, what you would uh, implement instead of this system. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, We'll start with Mary this time. Sure. I think ultimately it will be. Uh, when you look at systems around the world, um, London's been mentioned, and I think any of us who've been to London, their turnstile system worked quite well, quite efficiently. People get through it fairly quickly. And uh, I, I am one of those people who believes that the estimates on fair evasion and what could be recouped are probably low. I think we are probably seeing more of it than, uh, than what's estimated, um, although we'll, we'll see that when the uh, uh, cards are introduced. The unfortunate part is that we didn't do that when we first built them. I think that's the unfortunate part, because retrofitting is so expensive. But I do think ultimately, in the long term, it will be a wise investment. Uh, Tiffany, I'm not a transit engineer and I don't have the information. I'm, an, I'm a data geek and I, I've asked for data about that and we haven't got the open data on that, so I don't know how many people are riding it. When you ask if I think it's a wise investment, um, I'm going to have to say no. I have two daughters who go to school in my riding along with 300 other children with asbestos dripping from the pipes. We have cracked asbestos insulation that's directly exposed to teachers and the cost to fix that is less than $1 million. Okay, I, I just can't for the life of me see why the turnstiles would be more important. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, to provide passengers safety and, uh, and to avoid um, fear evasion, I think they'll do uh, some of that work. But I think when they were, um, a decision was made to, uh, to institute them, the Minister of, of Transportation went to London. He said, well, they have those um, uh, fare gates there. I'm going to have them here. There, the, the TransLink's internal study actually showed there was no business case. So, but the decisions made, money spent is there. But I'm hoping that uh, the, the passenger safety and the fare evasion that, that, that is being proposed right now, uh, uh, hopefully that we will recoup some of that money. Great, Jane. 
Uh, like Duane, I'm not a, a transportation engineer. Um, I, I do understand that uh, the perception of fare evasion and, and controlling that uh, is part of the decision making that, that drives us into these kinds of choices and that they don't necessarily address the fundamental problems that we have within the transportation system, even the fare evasion system. So um, it, the money has been spent. Was it a good decision? I would have to say uh, I doubt it. Second one. Yep. Here we go. Good evening. Uh, Lawrence Frank, a professor at UBC in sustainable transportation. This is an interesting dialogue. I'm curious about your thoughts of whether or not you would support a performance-based approach to transportation funding where jurisdictions by some formula were given an incentive to change their land use patterns over time or to do a myriad of factors, adopt programs to support uh, demand management was mentioned, uh, an interest in data and objective measurement was mentioned, so that there was a rationalized approach to being able to say, you know, over the next five years, how well did this jurisdiction do in, you know, supporting uh, the kind of investments that, that we might make? So why invest in transit in a jurisdiction that's not putting forward transit-supported land use? Would you support that or not? Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Lawrence. Um, I'm, I'm not a civil engineer as well as not being a transit engineer, so I, I can't talk about the specifics, but I'm a, I'm a big fan of feedback loops and performance uh, measurements. Uh, one of the projects I worked on with the U.S. Department of Energy was on smart buildings and measuring a uh, building before and after an energy efficient retrofit to be able to then make a blueprint for what other buildings would benefit from the same kind of refit to save energy. So what you're describing, uh, although I don't know the specifics of how it would work, does make a lot of sense. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of, uh, you know, factual, scientific-driven approach that I really like. Um, I'm a geek, so that's my nature, so. <laughs> so, uh, planning like that can absolutely change communities for the better. Uh, there's a really good example in what's taking place in the long-term community plan for the city of Langley, uh, which will transform it into a place that would have mixed commercial residential instead of these low-rise, low-density, uh, commercial and then uh, some more sprawl in terms of uh, planning for residential parts of the community. Here's the challenge with that plan and here's why I would hesitate is that when it comes to community planning we may all have an idea of how we could point to that community over there and tell them how they should plan their community. They have locally elected mayors and councillors who are elected to make those decisions. And I'll tell you that as a person who has grown up in the valley and lives now in Langley, uh, you do not uh, catch as many flies with vinegar as you do with honey. And to try and tell communities south of the Fraser, for example, that thou shalt do what people in Vancouver want you to do doesn't go over really well. Thank you, Perry. I think there are a lot of merit to that, uh, that thought, and I think I give a lot more credit to the local mayors and uh, local councillors uh, to making those decisions because they, they all understand land use decisions and transportations go hand in hand. They understand that. And I think, you know, if we work with them and encourage them to make those decisions accordingly, then, 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 that, then they will, there will be benefit as far as the transportation uh, services are concerned. I think they will agree, but you need to work with them. There's no doubt about that. You can't have top-down uh, decision-making process as we see today. We know what's best for you, and we will make those decisions for you. But you need to work with those mayors. That's why it's important to bring those mayors back onto the TransLink board, work with them, and say, how do we plan uh, for the entire Lower Mainland? Thank you. Jane. Uh, I think you've uh, probably got lots more expertise uh, than, than most of us in the room uh, related to your thinking about how we could create more sustainable communities. And I do think that those kinds of strategies needs to be, need to be part of the, con uh, the conversation. We've got lots of assumptions being tossed around here that we're going to continue to grow at the same rate that we're growing. We're going to be able to sprawl out till who knows, maybe to hope. 
um, in the Fraser Valley, and and uh, quite frankly, that's uh, that's not going to happen. It can't happen if we want to uh, deal with uh, issues like climate change. So we do have to start thinking differently about how we're formulating our community, and we may need to use the stick approach in order to uh, get our, or maybe an educational approach, so that we get our local communities understanding that the decisions that they make about land use have profound effects where uh, further down the valley, uh, upstream, downstream, and, and maybe we need to set conditions. Uh, we're gonna do that, regulate business, we can regulate community. Third question, Brenda? I think it was a gentleman on the right-hand side. Yeah. Daryl from Surrey. Okay. The youth population who are among the Metro's heavily transit dependent and will be stymied by the lack thereof are under 18 and will, so will have no voice in the tw November 2014 referendum on TransLink funding. Was this considered? And with this now in mind, do you still think a referendum is the right way to address the issue of funding? Why or why not? I'm going to start with you, Mary, since sure. you mentioned the re referendum. So uh, don't, don't limit your thinking of a referendum to a yes, no, thumbs up, thumbs down as to whether or not TransLink should get more funding. Um, there are many different options for new funding sources for TransLink. And the idea is that the work we're currently doing between myself and the chair and the vice chair of TransLink would develop proposals which could be taken to the public probably in combination. You're probably not going to find one. So it's probably going to be something like here are three or four options um, and which is your preferred one. In terms of youth, uh, youth are always uh, clamoring to have an influence and they should and it's exciting when they're involved in campaigns and I have youth volunteers. Um, but I think where you can have the impact is in the broad consultation that we will be engaged in between the spring of 2014 and when that referendum takes place. And I would encourage you to do that because there's an awful lot that you can contribute in terms of daily experience and also your future. Harry. We are elected to make decisions no matter how tough they are. I think putting this issue to referendum, which will not take place another 18 months, I think it's a shirking off our responsibility. I think that shouldn't happen. <laughs> September 2010, the province signed a memorandum of, of understanding with the local mayors committing themselves that they will find a long-term sustainable funding formula to pay for the services that we need today and for the long term. Today we are talking about the same thing, same thing over again, that we will find a long-term sustainable funding formula through now referendum. It's the, it's the south of the Fraser communities who are waiting and waiting to see if there's going to be expansion of public transportation in that area, because that's the fastest growing community. All those 1.2 million people that I talked about, many of them will be moving into South of the Fraser, and I think we are shir shirking off our responsibility as politicians. I think it's not going well, and it's not the right thing to do. Jane. Uh, referendums are a very imperfect way to gauge uh, the people's support for projects. And they tend to be divisive in communities rather than bringing community together. They tend to be deemed to be community consultation when in fact they're not. They're just uh, simply a majority rules kind of um, forcing of opinion on uh, a region. Uh, and often uh, just a slight majority will, will set the stage. So I personally don't think a referendum is a way to approach these large scale questions. I think we need to have uh, better land use planning and I think we need to have better community, uh, the, the, the involvement of people in community uh, to look at how we're going to set the conditions for how we move forward in this region. Dwayne. Well, it's a boring debate when most of the candidates agree on one thing, and I think that the referendum is perhaps a very wasteful um, potential to go forward. Um, elected officials are supposed to make certain decisions, and there's other ways to collect public input into the decision-making process, uh, consultations. I was at an open house with uh, Councillor Jeff Meggs and Gregor Robertson, and we had a full house. We had a lot of really good ideas going and discussing the UBC SkyTrain extension. 
Uh, there are very effective ways to deal with, with these kinds of deals. I believe referendums should really be reserved for instances where there is a conflict of interest perhaps within government and maybe the government shouldn't be making the decision without the public consultation. Um, when it comes to, Daryl, to your question about the youth and not be feeling disenfranchised with it, in my riding, uh, if elected, I'll be holding regular town hall meetings because MLAs should listen to the constituents, to all the constituents. Um, you know, good idea. When I worked at Adobe, we had a motto, which is good ideas can come from everywhere. Thanks. It's, a, it's quite incredible. If you think of this issue, we've already covered <laughs> governance, funding, planning, turnstiles, and referendum <laughs> in very few short questions. I'm going to go to the Twitter world now and, and back to Chris. Uh, a short and sweet question from Twitter. Why do we talk about goods movement and people movement separately? Ah, Harry, we're going to start with you. And Sir, could you repeat the question? Why oh, sorry. sorry. Why do we talk about goods movement and people movement separately? It's a good question, and I think, uh, uh, well, for people movement, we need public transportation, and for goods movement, we need trucks, and we need rails, we need uh, uh, sea, uh, uh, short sea shipping, and uh, all those uh, different modes of transportation. Those two are, are, are two different modes of transportation, and that's why we need to look at both. If we can move some of the cars that <clears throat> are supposed to move people, and then, then that will make it much more efficient for the truckers, for, for our other uh, modes of transportation to move goods that will be needed to service the, the population that we need to move out of the public transport, or through the public transportation. Well, this is where I, what I was going to say to Mary afterwards would give, give you an idea of me as an amateur engineer. Um, I agree, uh, Chris, whoever sent that question has a good point. Um, you know, doing the subway route, duplicating SkyTrain has a lot of limitations with respect to that. If we were to use the existing rail corridors were available from VCC through down to the Athletes Village up to False Creek uh, to Granville Island, the trains don't have to just carry people. They actually can carry cargo as well. We can get trucks off the road. We can clear up our streets for cyclists, for other uh, purposes. Um, there's a lot of wisdom to a lot of people who are providing input into the uh, transportation, and I know it probably drives Mary nuts on a daily basis, but um, I think there's a lot of validity to the idea of uh, mixed-use uh, rail within the city. Let's go over to you, Jane. Uh, I think it's a good question. Uh, why do we talk about uh, the movement of people and goods separately? Uh, the more we do that, the more we, uh, we have these uh, perceptions that we have to have a different philosophy of developing our communities because we have trade on one hand and people on the other. Uh, the Green Party believes that we really need to move to a different economic model, one that's based in strong local communities. And if we have strong local communities, then uh, we need less travel for our goods and ourselves. Uh, we, can, we can design our communities around that, um, that philosophy of, of how do we go about uh, creating that, that, that intact community that has our goods locally, so we travel less, the goods travel less to us, uh, it would mean we could have smaller homes. It could mean that we have more leisure time. And so uh, I think it's an excellent question and one that we as uh, transportation planners need to be thinking about. Maybe we need to bring those two thoughts together in our planning. Thank you. I apologize. I've got a, I'm getting over a cold, so I've got a, a bit of the remnants of it. Uh, I can tell you why I do. Uh, I do because very often in our more urban environments, people forget about the importance of freight and goods movement in British Columbia. We're a small open trading economy. Um, we now are the province least dependent on the United States for trade. Um, it's hugely important to future growth, which is hugely important to funding all the programs that we believe are important, including things like transit and BC ferries. So the reason that I do is because very often in our uh, Metro Vancouver world, people forget about the importance of goods movement and you need to constantly keep that on the table um, so that you are remembering the balance that you have to strike. Next three questions. We're going to go one here, one right down here, and we'll take one right at the back, the last question at the back. So one Peter Ladner here, there was one, I think it was on this side. <coughs> Hi, Peter Ladner here, I won't stand up. Um, <laughs> one of the things that's killing the provincial economy is rising health care costs. 
And we are now knowing, thanks to the work of people like Larry Frank, the impacts of trans the way we move on our health. We know, for example, car dependency is contributing to the obesity epidemic, which is contributing to a lot of these costs that could easily be, these diseases that could easily be avoided with different planning and different ways of moving around. Are you prepared to make health care implications a priority in deciding transportation spending? I'm going to go to Jane this time to start. Uh, great uh, question. I think absolutely. We think that the, uh, the social determinants of health, the community determinants of health ought to be um, part of our land use planning. So absolutely. Harry. Certainly, it is one of the determinants what kind of a transportation system that we should have. It uh, deals with the economy, it deals with our health, it deal deals with our quality of life, environment, all those fits together. I think those are the, the determining factor why we need to have a good transportation system so that we could deal with all those issues. Thank you. And when I was, uh, when I had responsibility for public health, I came smack into all those statistics and, and they're very stark. Um, we do have to acknowledge, I think, off the top, that not every community in British Columbia is going to be a place where walking and cycling can form a significant part of transportation at, at many times during the year. But for those of us um, in the Lower Mainland and particularly in urban environments, um, creating communities where walkability is possible, creating communities where you have higher densities that allow for better expansion of transit faster, um, those are all things that contribute to good health. What we've done in policy is ensured that, first of all, when when we uh, construct major infrastructure projects, they will always have cycling infrastructure built into them. Portman, probably the best example, largest cycling infrastructure project in the history of the province. And when it's done, it'll connect on both sides um, to the cycling pathways that we've created, both on the Coquitlam side and also on the Surrey side. Um, but it's the same is true for Sea to Sky, W.R. Bennett, or indeed as we get to the uh, George Massey Tunnel. That's one, sorry, one example, my time's up, sorry. Uh, so, Peter, you're, a you're, you're asking me, and I'm a, I'm a guy who spent most of my life racing for money, racing bicycles. I love cycling. Um, but it's not always as simple as that either. Uh, last July, I was riding on one of the cycling paths on West 7th Avenue, and I got hit head-on by a car. It's the reason I'm not cycling down here tonight, why I had to drive my car. I'm still injured from that. Um, there is a, definitely a, a, a huge incentive. I believe in physical fitness. I believe in staying in shape. I don't know how much you can correlate it with the, um, you know, the transit plan to a, to a very certain degree. If the data supports that a lot of people will ride their bike if there's a new bike corridor, I'm the first guy in line to say, let's do it, okay? I love cycling, it's my life. Um, but unless the, unless the data is there that we can make factual decisions, uh, there's you know, no point in starting to you know, retrofit streets that nobody's going to use. So I'm, I'm a little bit mixed on it. Agar, and I have the privilege of volunteering with Carbon Talks. Um, when I'm talking about transportation issues, I always have to wonder how much of these are divided along socioeconomic lines, and I thought maybe you could comment on that. So, so how much are transportation issues divided on socioeconomic lines? Dwayne, we're going to start with you this time. Sure. Um, sorry, I didn't catch your name, but... Um, it's Betsy. Um, it's actually uh, we, we've seen some data that suggests that it is. And uh, with the carbon tax in particular, um, you have uh, this uh, distinction that some of the people who cannot really have access to affordable or alternative ways of transportation are being unfairly hit. And same with the bridge tolls. Uh, we've taken action already. We've expressed that if we uh, get into the uh, legislature, we're going to be very active in trying to help some of the people who are being unfairly hit by those taxes. Um, I was lucky in life. I was a high-tech uh, success. I made a lot of money. I can very easily pay a toll or you know, make alternative arrangements or, or not go to work. Um, not everybody can. It's not the reality. And I think that the society, as a society, when we're looking at next generation transportation, we have to take into account that there are people out there that are dependent on us making the decisions to actually protect them, the, the people who are at least available to take care of themselves. Jane, over to you. Uh, I think that uh, we need to acknowledge that low-income people are disproportionately punished on virtually every 
uh, aspect of living uh, from transportation to healthcare to um, access to jobs to virtually everything that we do. Uh, we do know that uh, often uh, cheaper housing is found further and further out and that people have to spend a lot of time commuting. That's very costly uh, to low-income people. Uh, they often have to drive uh, cheap vehicles that are much more expensive to, uh, to maintain and to drive, and so that's more expensive to low-income people. And uh, so when we're, when we're planning transportation, I think that we need to find a way to get the voices of, uh, to, to ensure that, that we don't disproportionately continue to penalize the people who are uh, low and uh, moderate income. Thank you. Uh, now, so in thinking about your question, uh, I think first of all, probably what is a greater uh, divisiveness in transportation policy is regional because of the differences in regional needs, uh, regional requirements, uh, regional desires for what they want to achieve. But in terms of uh, what the impact of, uh, of transportation policy and socioeconomics, I actually think that the, from what I hear from people and from what I see from the taxation data uh, versus uh, what comes back in tax credits and programs, et cetera, the folks who are the most challenged right now in terms of affordability, and I think it includes the area of transit, are those in that middle class. Um, governments over many years, not just ours previous governments, have done a lot to take a look at very low income people. Um, and it's left quite a significant gap in terms of programming and tax credit consideration for those who are in that middle income bracket. And if you look at the taxation and credit data, and if you look at what's there for programs, it's the middle class who are the most challenged. Thank you. And uh, I think, you know, uh, the decisions that are being made uh, about public transportation, um, the low income people and the middle class, uh, they are being hit and because, because of the taxes like carbon tax and, and, and gas tax. Uh, they, are, they are made uh, to, to continue to pay, but we haven't given them the public transportation system to leave their cars and go to the public transportation. I think pu public transportation system can actually equalize uh, uh, some of the, the uses, um, you know, um, regardless of where uh, you, know, you fit in the economic ladder. Uh, because uh, it, if it's affordable, if it's accessible, if it's efficient. Hi, my name's Tony Valente. Um, in a recent article, Peter Ladner wrote, <laughs> and he suggested that we need one list of projects in Metro Vancouver. And Peter, I'm very happy you're here to hear this tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and so what he was suggesting was we don't need one list of projects with TransLink and one with the Ministry of Transportation. And yes, I'm referring to the Massey Tunnel project. And so I would ask candidates, do you agree we need one list? Why or why not? And if so, how do you propose we get there? Okay. Harry, we're going to start with you. What uh, so that was Tony, and he was asking the question on, do you agree that there should be one list? Uh, or perhaps, Tony, you could clarify. There's currently two, one for Ministry of Transportation, one for TransLink, or should we go to you, Peter, and ask for the clarification? Yeah. Tony? <laughs> Peter, no, you go ahead. So you you were my understanding to is that there's one list for Ministry of Transportation and one list for TransLink, and they're not being they're not treated combined. as one list for this region. Yeah. So so the if I understand your question correctly, the the TransLink is to uh, deliver us the public transportation in Lower Mainland and the and the roads and the bridges that comes within their their jurisdiction. But then there are projects, bridges, and roads that are outside of the TransLink jurisdiction that comes under the Ministry of Transportation, such as Massey Tunnel. And Patolo becomes, uh, it, actually, it is the, the part of the TransLink. So you're suggesting whether it should come under Ministry of Transportation rather than leaving it under uh, transportation, some of the lower mainland areas? So I, everyone heard that? We need to do it in a consistent manner. <clears throat> I'm just going to give Harry a few more minutes. Or the, way, a few more the way it is set up now, the TransLink is given a, a number of revenue um, uh, sources, and, and they use that for their operating funding. And also they use part of that to pay for the debt servicing, the debt that they incur uh, when they uh, you know, uh, spend on, on capital. 
the Ministry of Transportation deal with the highways and the bridges that comes under the Ministry of Transportation outside of the TransLink. Now, uh, that's the decision that, that you know, we could make, but I think you know, that's the decision that was made, by, and, and I think, I think uh, right now it's not a bad decision. Leave TransLink where they are, give them tools that they need to provide us the services that they need, uh, that we need, and, and, and help them with the capital funding wherever we can by engaging both levels of government. And in, a, in, in fairness, you have a few extra seconds here, Mary, as well. To <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to take a stab at imagining that what Peter's getting at is that you're not going to be successful if your planning isn't integrated. Um, so I, provincial highways, though, uh, do serve a broader purpose than what you would see TransLink being responsible for in terms of its governance. I'm not saying there isn't some crossover. There is. Um, but there are distinctly two jurisdictions, and if you look at a route like 99, um, there are very many other purposes um, that go beyond what TransLink would ever be responsible for. Having said that, we are doing a lot better now with planning together around the major road network that TransLink is responsible for. Good example is the Patella Bridge. We have right now, the uh, project group is made up of TransLink representatives, representatives from the city of Surrey, representatives from the city of, Bank, of New Westminster, and also senior ministry staff, um, and they are working together to plan what's gonna happen on the patella. We will engage in the same kind of dialogue around the Massey Tunnel, making sure that we're integrating with the existing road network, um, and that we're also thinking about how we will eventually utilize that corridor to improve bus transportation. We have, for example, within the current project, um, that is taking place with South Fraser Perimeter Road and some of the improvements leading up to Massey, dedicated bus lanes that are being put in. So we are already doing that 100-year thinking and thinking forward to how we integrate transit into that corridor. Um, I'm not going to second guess um, whether Peter's suggestion is, is uh, good or is, is not good. Um, but my party does believe that there needs to be a lot more taxpayer scrutiny on TransLink in particular, and specifically a lot more uh, ability to provide input from the public in the process. Um, if there is an efficiency to doing it one way or the other, I would listen to both sides of the argument and uh, make up my mind from those who are actually working in the field uh, to tell me which way is best. Uh, the integration, though, the way um, uh, that uh, Mary had summed it up, if, they, if it could be more efficient if we plan an integrated uh, system for the whole valley and we take into account kind of a more holistic view of uh, public transit or the next generation of transit, I'm all for it. Um, as far as the, the list goes, I'm not sure, I wasn't really clear what the uh, alternative is to one list. Um, the, if the one list represents planning an integrated approach and the alternative is to not plan it as an integrated approach, I think I'd rather take it as an integrated approach. So. Jane. Uh, I think that um, one list is uh, important, uh, but I think before we make lists, we need to look at what is the purpose of our transportation system and are there are alternative ways of approaching what we're trying to do? For instance, um, there were some UBC professors that uh, indicated that for the money we spent on the Portman Bridge, we could have had uh, rail throughout um, the lower mainland to Surrey. And if we, if we are able to think differently about uh, what our current needs are and what our future needs are, maybe we'd, we would make different decisions about how we would approach the transportation system. What I hear over and over again is roads and bridges, roads and bridges. And um, that, that um, is, is old thinking and we need new thinking for a different form of community of the future. This will be the last question coming from Twitter, and I wanted to just give the heads up as well. We're going to be going to closing statements, and you've been very tame tonight. Yeah. I'm just, I, this has been a very, we've been also very polite and Canadian tonight, haven't we? Um, but just to give you a little warning, uh, last question, and then we'll go to closing statements. Sure, we've, we've had a number of questions on Twitter about pedestrians, so one of them being, what would your party do to promote safer streets for pedestrians and cyclists? So we've got streets, and I'm going to go to Jane this time to start. Safer streets for pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, that's very much a local government issue, a community issue of how we're going to uh, create safer streets. And again, there's a price tag for everything that we have to do uh, in order to do that. Uh, it's enormous amount of money to build sidewalks. 
Uh, sidewalks uh, need to be uh, thought of differently if we're, if we're really going to be pedestrian-friendly communities. They have to be wider, they have to be uh, more pleasing in terms of uh, making sure that there are places uh, to go, village kinds of concepts. And um, we are committed as a party to uh, more infrastructure for pedestrians, more infrastructure for cyclists, safer in infrastructure in both of those modes of transportation. Again, we're, we're looking at, at how do we transition our economy off this belief that we can dig up BC and sell it to China, and how do we create strong local economies throughout British Columbia that serve the people and the communities that we want to have in the future. Mary. Thank you. Uh, Jane's quite right. The, uh, the walking part of it, the pedestrian part of it, really is mainly a local issue. Um, I, our responsibility is for highways, and of course, uh, people don't typically, uh, there aren't typically many pedestrians on highways. I will say this, though. Uh, in terms of cycling, I've uh, mentioned that our policy is to include cycling infrastructure within major road projects. We also, though, in terms of pedestrians and cyclists, uh, have a partnership with local governments uh, where we fund through Bike BC, for example, since 2001, about $148 million in local projects in communities all around the province. And the same is true through projects like a Local Motion and others where we share funding with local governments for priorities that they have around better pedestrian infrastructure. So there are ways to contribute to it, um, and it's, uh, but it has to be done with the local governments. Oh, I should add one thing since I have a minute. Uh, one thing that was raised to me and that I think we really need... Oh. We'll come back to it. You'll have a minute. <laughs> and, and just, Harry. Thank you. And I think many communities outside of TransLink uh, already are working on, on having a, a biking program, a walking program, so, uh, as far as having a better and safe uh, uh, sidewalks and b biking trails. Um, but if TransLink and the local communities here in Lower Mainland can work better and have a better coordination, I think we can improve upon that. Uh, and outside of Lower Mainland, uh, other communities are uh, looking at, and many of them have actually adopted uh, biking lanes, and it's costly, and they always are looking at uh, and looking up to the provincial government for, for additional help. And um, you know, many of the, the biking activists are out there lobbying, and I think they're doing a good job, and we need to improve both of those areas. Um, so I'm going to just answer with the uh, the uh, fact that I mean, if you're if the question, Chris, was directed at uh, what's going to make it safer for pedestrians and cyclists, and you're addressing provincial MLA candidates, I'm presuming that that is directed at the uh, roads that are under the care of the provincial government. Um, I, for one, have actually been happy with what's happened with the Highway 99, with the provisions for bicycling. Um, I think it was really good. Um, I'd like to see that continue. Uh, there's um, not a lot of time, though, when I would recommend to somebody that they should be walking on a provincial highway. Um, it's not always the best, safest thing to do. Uh, if there's no alternative, certainly, and, uh, and it's uh, a necessity, I think that's something that has to be factored into the regional transit plan. I mean, walking is part of transit. Uh, whether you have trains, whether you have cars, bicycles, buses, whatever, you still have to walk to and from them. So. so one of the problems in, in, in any kind of forum like this is we're only getting at a fraction of the questions. So I want to just get a show of hands. If you could have asked a question, just put up your hand if you had a question to ask. Oh my. Yeah. Take a look at that. <laughs> I had many. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is if you are on Twitter or you are on Facebook, let's get this dialogue really going. Go to our hashtag, BC Transpo or go to the Carbon Talks or the SFU Public Square or any of these candidates or any of the political parties or the independents that you met or the other political parties that you've heard from tonight um, and ask those questions. Let's start and ensure that the whole issue of transportation is on the agenda for this election. Um, I, I am sorry that we weren't able to get to a number of the questions that you had, because I know there were many good ones. But we did get to 12, and that's not a bad start. And I have to commend our incredible candidates here for the, I think, the intellectual rigor that they have brought to this conversation. I think it's been great. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to go to all of you. This time, I'm going to go in alphabetical order by your last name. So Harry, you're getting the warning first. <laughs> 
for your closing statements and two minutes uh, to share your wisdom and, and uh, brilliant thoughts, the things that you want us to leave with tonight um, as we go forth and uh, go forth and vote. So, Harry, no pressure. Thank you. As I said before, regardless what we think, but the Metro Vancouver statistics show, and their assumptions are that 1.2 million additional people will be living in Lower Mainland in the next 30 years. We need to start planning today so that we can start, you know, have a plan to move them and the goods to service them. We cannot do that if we continue to go the route that we are going today. We need to, first of all, catch up to the, to the uh, transit services that we need today, especially south of the Fraser. There is a one hour or service on per capita basis compared to uh, on the other side of the river. It doesn't mean that the, that the Vancouver and Burnaby and Richmond have a, 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 you know, a number one and, and the best public transportation system. It just shows how far behind South of the Fraser is. To say that we will uh, put that question to referendum to deal with that issue, I think it's a shirking of responsibility. We cannot afford to do that. So what we need to do, make the, the TransLink uh, governance start working again by changing by bringing the, uh, the locally elected people onto that board so that when they're making land use decision and public transportation decisions, that they know exactly what they're talking about. Then use some of the carbon tax money. Money's already there. Take some of that money, take it to the, to the newly uh, appointed board or elected board and say, look, here's some of the money that we need to deal with some of the traffic concessions and some of the pass-ups that we have, the people having to wait at the bus stations, uh, bus, bus stops uh, all this time, that we need to fix that problem immediately and what can we do to deal with the long-term solution to, by coming up with a long-term sustainable funding formula, working with those local mayors so that we have a world-class uh, public transportation, transportation system that is efficient, that is affordable, and that is actually user-friendly. Thank you. Dwayne. Um, in the software industry, we use something called patterns, and it's modeled from a book by a brilliant Viennese-born architect called Christopher Alexander. And the idea is to look around for patterns that work and apply them where we can. And I think that is one of the fundamental cores of what the regional transit planning needs to take into account. Now, I'm with the BC Conservative Party. We're not the Federal Conservative Party. Um, I'm a fiscal conservative, thank you. I'm a fiscal conservative. We believe that every dollar paid by taxpayers is held in trust, and it should be held in trust in a transparent manner that's spent in an accountable way in your best interests. And that's, a, I know it's a new idea in government, so. Um, we believe that um, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of good ideas. I've heard actually really good ideas from all of the the candidates tonight. You know everybody has a part, a voice to play in this. Um, you know there's some good ideas. The one question about the the moving of goods, uh, you know, going with an S bond, we can certainly use the same train system to deliver goods within the city instead of using all these different trucks to deliver goods around the uh, the core lines. Um, we also believe in our party that government should be scaled back to providing essential services. Transportation is an essential service. And efficient transportation is a right that we should have in this province. Not just for Vancouver, not just for the Lower Mainland. We're thinking uh, largely tonight, I think, in terms of the Lower Mainland, but there's still the island, the north, the interior. There's a number of other regions that can benefit from improvements in uh, transportation. So. We need to have a balanced perspective on it. Um, one last thing, on, uh, to keep the conversation going on Twitter, yes, I did tweet up here on the stage. I am at Dwayne Nichol, and I'm happy to, <laughs> if you follow me, I'm happy to uh, go ahead and answer questions after the forum. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jane, and thank you for that offer as well. Mary. Yeah. Thank you, and thank you very much for the dialogue tonight. I've quite enjoyed it. It's, it's yeah. wonderful to have an opportunity to really be throwing back and forth the ideas and unpack them a little bit. Um, 
clearly from our dialogue tonight, and I can tell you from being transportation and infrastructure minister, there are no simple answers to any of the questions that we've been asking. But we all know they need to be asked, and I want to leave you with some things to think about as you construct your Twitter questions. Certainly use the hashtag that Shauna gave you. Um, use our Twitter handles. Mine is at Mary4BC. Um, we love to get your questions, especially during, ele during an election. But I think what we're recognizing is that regardless of who's elected to Victoria or even our local governments, there's some really big questions we have to wrestle with as a society. All of us are going to have to think about, in particular on the Lower Mainland. How do we envision transportation that works for the entire province? We're a big place. You could probably pave all of Saskatchewan for the same cost as a few miles of mountain British Columbia Highway. Um, how do we wrestle with that in a world that is moving to different types of standards and expectations? A growing population south of the Fraser, which much as folks in Vancouver think about their needs, folks south of the Fraser think, you know what, I don't want to pay for Vancouver's transit. And finally, when we think about goods movement, we want to have our quiet and pastoral settings. We want to have our green environment. We also want to be able to afford the services that we need to keep our society whole. How are we going to deal with increased goods movement, trade with Asia potentially, more trade with Asia, perhaps more trade with other countries? How much of that do we want to do? Where do we want it to take place? These are questions that no government in one legislative session or in one debate like this are going to be able to answer. But all of us together can. But we have to be free to dialogue about it and to throw these ideas out. And thank you for doing that tonight. Thank you, Mary. Jane. Uh, well, I want to thank you all for your questions and for coming and having more questions. Um, I have a sense that we haven't really addressed the real issues, that there are all kinds of things that are um, based in assumption, based in misunderstanding. And, and I even have a sense that there may be more expertise out there than there is here if we really wanted to get to better planning for our future. I know there are university professors, I know there are people with uh, lifetimes worth of experience uh, that we should tap into. And I think we're dealing with a phenomenon which the Green Party is very concerned about, and that is that uh, we have this, this push at the point of an election where we want to have some input, some influence with our government. And then after the election's over, we find no means to have that influence. And the Green Party doesn't believe that that's a sustainable model for government for the future. We think that we need to be engaging citizens around all of these issues. They are life and death issues in terms of the survival of the planet. Uh, there are lots of ideas that the Green Party has. Our Green Book 2013 is online on our website, greenparty.bc.ca, under new ideas. We have got lots of ideas for transportation related to climate change. We've got lots of ideas for transportation related to the economy. We've got lots of ideas for transportation related to our sustainable, the sustainableness of our social services. So we've got great ideas, and you've got great ideas, and we can't just allow our elections to be that barrier. I've heard I've heard politicians say tonight that we're elected to make the decisions, but that isn't the way that our democracy will improve. Our democracy will improve if the elected politicians are reaching out to the people that they represent and bringing the ideas of all of those people together into the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I don't think we do enough is acknowledge the people that run for office. And um, it takes a great deal of personal sacrifice, a great deal of persistence, uh, and um, tenacity to do what you do. And I just want to take a moment to just acknowledge all of you on this panel and all of you who have are running for office, have run for us, office, or are currently in office. I mean, I see our, one of our councillors here in the city of Vancouver, Jeff Meggs, in the audience as well. So I just want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank you for doing that. <laughs>